Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Monday, October 4th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. It's been a very busy day and a hectic day. We know Facebook was down for a good portion of the day. Facebook and um, other social media platforms owned by Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. So that caused a lot of problems for people today in their businesses. So on today's show, um, I want to do a follow up on a story that we talked about back in uh, July. Okay. And we know back uh, in July, we talked about Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks, African-American woman whose uh, sales were taken without her permission when she uh, went to the hospital because of uh, cervical cancer. And it was back uh, late July 2021 um, that we told you that the family of Henrietta Lacks hired attorney Benjamin Crump to sue pharmaceutical companies for building wealth off of the sales of Henrietta Lacks. And the sales of Henrietta Lacks have been used in uh, scientific breakthroughs like uh, gene mapping and in vitro fertilization and the polio vaccine. Well, it was announced today uh, and there was a press conference held today that uh, the family of Henrietta Lacks and attorney Benjamin Crump are filing a lawsuit against a biotech company against a biotech company for profiting off of the uh sales of henrietta Lacks for decades and they are suing the thermo fisher scientific uh the thermo fisher scientific inc of waltham massachusetts and they are saying that this company has continued to commercialize the results. What well, well, they're saying that this company has uh, uh, continues to make money off of the sales of Henrietta Lacks. So we're going to talk about this lawsuit today. Um, it's very, very interesting. And there's some um, I, I knew about. Um, Henrietta Lacks sales being used in in vitro fertilization as well as the polio vaccine. But I found out today there was an interview that I want to share with you that attorney Benjamin Crump did with um, CBS News and, and doing research on this. Uh, I'm looking at some uh, uh, other articles, National Public Radio as well NPR, National Public Radio. And Henrietta Lacks sales were not just used in the polio vaccine and for genetic mapping, but also used in the COVID-19 vaccine as well. Henrietta Lacks sales were also used in the COVID-19 vaccine also. So we're gonna talk about this in this, is this lawsuit that was filed today. Uh, and then we're going to do a follow up to uh, the story that we did on Sunday. We had a great show Sunday, jam packed show Sunday. But Sunday we talked about how police killings for about the past 40 years have been undercounted. Police killings for about the past 40 years have been uh, undercounted in the U.S. And uh, they've been under it's about they've been undercounted by about 55 percent. So on, uh, th so this was a study that came out on Thursday, September 30th, 2021. New York Times has a, had a big article about this. We talked about it on uh, yesterday's show. Well, on the Black News Channel, they had a uh, really good segment. You know, Dieter Walde had a good segment on the Black News Channel uh, where they talked about this study but they also they also dealt with how uh, states 
are taking matters into their own hand to uh, pass new laws dealing with police accountability. And they cited Maryland and California. OK, we're going to talk about that as well. That's a follow up to our story from Sunday. And then also on Sunday's show, we did not get a chance to deal with the, uh, you know, September 18th was the anniversary of the passing of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which was part of the Missouri, uh, it was part of the Compromise of 1850. So we're going to talk uh, about that as well. OK, uh, we'll discuss that also uh, the Fugitive Slave Act of um, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. All right. Now, uh, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with. It's based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. The sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. The sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Sign up for our email newsletter there as well, the AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. Um, we'll tell you also later about the uh, 10-week online course that I teach on Sundays. It just started up, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We'll talk about that later, and that's at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, I want to jump into um, this first uh, topic here. So this is a follow-up to a story we did back in late July, around July 30th, dealing with uh, Henrietta Lacks and uh, her family. Um, her family in late July hired attorney uh, Benjamin Crump hired attorney Benjamin Crump to um, sue a pharmaceutical company that they said has been profiting from uh, her sales, okay, for decades. And I was looking at a number of different articles about this today. We're going to, we're going to go to clip number one from CBS News in just a second here, Shakita. There's a good article here from uh, National Public Radio. Uh, let's pull this up here. It's a good article from National Public Radio, NPR.org. Henrietta Lacks estate sued a company saying it used her stolen sales for research. Used her stolen sales for research. Um, the estate of Henrietta Lacks sued a biotech company on Monday accusing it of selling sales that doctors at John Hopkins uh, Hospital took from this African-American woman, Henrietta Lacks, in 1951 without her knowledge or consent as part of a racially unjust medical system, quote unquote, part of a racially unjust medical system. Uh, uh, tissue taken from Henrietta Lacks' tumor before she died of cervical cancer became the first human sales to be successfully cloned. The first human sales to be successfully cloned, reproduced infinitely ever since HeLa sales have become a cornerstone of modern medicine, enabling countless scientific and medical innovations, including the development of the polio vaccine including the development of the polio vaccine, genetic mapping, and even COVID-19 vaccines. They've all used Henrietta Lacks sales. They've all used this African-American woman's sales. And her family 
has never been compensated. Now, Henrietta Lacks sales were harvested and developed long before the advent consent procedures used in medicine and scientific research today. But lawyers for her family say Thermo Fisher Scientific Inc. Thermo Fisher Scientific Inc. of Waltham, Massachusetts has continued to commercialize the results it has continued to commercialize the results well after the origins of the HeLa cells became well known. Uh, uh, Attorney Benjamin Crump said Monday at a news conference, Monday, October 4th, that is, it is outrageous that this company would think that they have intellectual rights, intellectual rights property to their grandmother's sales. Why is it they have intellectual rights to her sales and can benefit billions of dollars, can benefit billions of dollars when her family, her flat blood, her black children get nothing? He said this Monday at a news conference outside the federal courthouse in uh, Baltimore. Now, John Hopkins uh, said it never sold or profited from the sale lines. The Gila cell lines, the the uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Gila is what the lines of Henrietta Lack cells were called. The first two letters of a first name and first two letters of a last name, Gila. But many companies have patented have patented uh, ways of using Henrietta Lack cells. Attorney Benjamin Crump said these distributors have made billions from the genetic material stolen from Henrietta Lack's body. Another family attorney, Christopher Seeger, hinted at related claims against other companies. He said Thermo Fisher Scientific, quote, should not feel too alone because they're going to have a lot, a lot of companies soon. They should not feel too alone because they're going to have a lot of companies soon. Um, I want to go to this clip here. We're going to start this and finish on the other side of the break. They spoke to uh, Benjamin Crump and uh, uh, members of Henry Lack's family spoke to CBS News today. Let's go to this clip, Shakita. Represent the family of Henrietta Lack. More than 70 years after her death, a lawsuit has been filed on behalf of Henrietta Lacks and her descendants over the cells that were taken without her consent. This lawsuit comes just in time for what would have been her 101st birthday this Sunday. In 1951, Lacks went to John Hopkins Hospital because of vaginal bleeding. Her doctor performed a biopsy and diagnosed her with cervical cancer. Without her consent, the doctor shared the cells with a cancer researcher who discovered her cells multiplied every 24 to 48 hours. CBS News spoke to the director of the National Institutes of Health in 2013 about those cells. This biopsy taken from Henrietta Lacks produced a cell line that would grow essentially forever and was immediately distributed all over the world. Her cells, nicknamed Tila, have been sold around the world and are still being used in medical research today, the latest being for the coronavirus vaccine. The family is now trying to reclaim her legacy by suing pharmaceutical companies for the use of those cells. Earlier, I spoke with civil rights attorney Ben Crump, who has decided to take on this case. Civil rights attorney Ben Crump and members of Henrietta Lacks' family join me now. Uh, welcome to all of you. Mr. Crump, why are you choosing to represent the family of Henrietta Lacks, and why now? On Sunday will be Henrietta Lacks' 101-year birthday. We want to make sure that the family voice is finally heard after 70 years of being an ignored. Okay. All right. Pause. Pause right there, Shakita. We're coming up on the break. Pause it right there. Okay. We're going to pause it right there. Continue this on the other side of the break. Now, today, October fourth, 
is the 70th anniversary of the passing of Henrietta Lacks. She passed away October 4th, 1951. They filed this lawsuit exactly 70 days after she died. Uh, we're going to continue this on the other side of the break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting, LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top-tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365, and Surface tablets, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive and socially conscious books. Blacklisted gives you access to curated content that will satisfy your curiosity to learn and understand different perspectives. Empower yourself through inspirational and actionable ideas. It's easy to read or listen to on the go. Blacklisted. Empower yourself. Start your free trial today. In the African History Network show, we do current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policy that put us in this predicament. It's only laws and policy that take it out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do a teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 9 to a.m. Superstation. Nine ten, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on nine ten a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Monday, October fourth, twenty twenty one, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Um, right before the break, we were talking about this story dealing with the family of uh, Henrietta Lacks and uh, her family and attorney Benjamin Crump filed a lawsuit um, today uh, on her behalf. Uh, and they are alleging that uh, they filed a lawsuit against the Thomas Fisher Scientific Inc., uh, which is a, a biotech company. And uh they are saying that this company continues to make money off of her sales. Okay. So call in numbers 313-778-7600, 313-778-7600 uh, is the call in number. If you have a question or comment now, just a little background information uh, on Henrietta Lacks. We talked now. We talked about this story back in uh, about July 31st, uh, about, about July 30th, 2021. Okay. And the, um, we, we talked about it back then, and they had hired Benjamin Crump. Okay. Uh, today they filed the lawsuit, and this is the 70th anniversary uh, of her uh, passing. She passed away October 4th, 1951. So January 1951, Henrietta Lacks was found to have cervical cancer. There's a really good article uh, from the New York Times about this and then also SmithsonianMag.com. Uh, one from the New York Times, a lasting gift to medicine that wasn't really a gift. OK, um, so in January 1951, Henrietta Lacks was found to have cervical cancer. She was treated with radium at John Hopkins uh, and then the, which was the standard care uh, in, uh, at that time 
but there was no stopping the cancer. Her doctor had never seen anything like it. Within months, her body was full of tumors and she died in excruciating pain that summer. She was 31 years old and left five children, the youngest just a year old. Uh, she had been a devoted mother and the children suffered ter terribly without her. Now, neither Henrietta Lacks nor any of her relatives knew that doctors had given a sample of her tumor to Dr. George Guy, G-E-Y, a, a John Hopkins uh, University researcher who was trying to find cells that would live indefinitely in culture so researchers could experiment on them. Before she came along, um, her efforts had failed. Before she came along, his efforts had failed. Her sales changed everything. They multiplied like crazy and never died. And we'll go back to this clip in just a second here. Um, but this is something that they talked about with her sales. And, and her sales uh, replicated every 24 to 48 hours. And they've been used uh, to develop things like the polio vaccine. They've been used um, for... Uh, gene mapping, in vitro fertilization. They were launched into space uh, for experiments uh, to see how they reacted in zero gravity. Um, the HeLa cells have been used to produce uh, uh, drugs for numerous diseases like Parkinson's, leukemia, and uh, flu vaccines as well. Um, many scientific landmarks have used uh, her genes and also cloning also cloning, gene mapping, and in vitro fertilization. So I, I talk about Henrietta Lacks in uh, my lecture series, Great African Women in History, The Mothers of Civilization. So I um, have been studying her for a number of years. We know there was the a movie that Oprah Winfrey did uh, for HBO uh, dealing with uh, Henrietta Lacks also. And there was the, there was the book uh, the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca, Rebecca Skloot, okay, that really helped to uh, expose the, inform people about the history of uh, Henrietta Lacks. All right, so this, this article here gives some background information from uh, the New York Times. This gives some background information on, uh, this is from February 1st, 2010. Uh, this is from the New York Times. A lasting gift, a lasting gift to medicine that wasn't really a gift. A lasting gift to medicine that wasn't really a gift. Um, so it goes on to say. Now, she was uh, 31 years old when she passed away. OK, her doctor never uh, had never seen anything like her cells replicating. Uh, Henrietta Lacks was 31. Uh, she died in excruciating pain October 4th, uh, 1951. She was 31 years old and left five children, the youngest just a year old. She had been a devoted mother and the children suffered terribly without her. Now, and here's a picture of her and um, here's a picture of her and her husband. Um, so doctors gave a sample of the cancer that killed her to a researcher without telling her fate. Now, a cell line called HeLa cells, like I said, the, the first two letters of her first and last name, HeLa cells, and they called them HeLa cells to hide where these cells came from. So for a long time, people were using these cells in, in the scientific community, but didn't know who they came from. Uh, now, those immortal cells soon became the workhorse for laboratories everywhere. HeLa cells were used to develop the first polio vaccine. They were launched into uh, space for experiments in zero gravity, and they helped produce uh, and they helped produce drugs for numerous diseases, including Parkinson's, leukemia, and the flu. Also, they were used, uh, uh, Attorney Benjamin Crump talks about uh, in the press, um, on CBS News today, he talks about how they were used um, in lipstick, 
and the makeup how they were used to, uh, to produce lipstick and makeup also now dr guy or dr gay g-e-y how you pronounce it uh not make money from the healer sales but they were commercialized now they are bought and sold every day the world over and they have generated millions in profits. I would say billions in profits uh, since 1951. I would say billions in profits. The, the Lax family never got a dime. They were, they were poor with little education and no health insurance. And some had serious physical or mental ailments. But they did not even know that tissue had been taken or that HeLa cells even existed until 20 years after Henrietta Lacks death. So you're talking about about 1971 that they found out that uh, her cells still existed and were being used. And they found out only by accident when her daughter in law met someone from the National Cancer Institute who recognized her surname Lacks, L-A-C-K-S, and said he was working with sales from a woman named Henrietta Lacks. The daughter-in-law rushed home and told Mrs. Lack's son, Lawrence, quote, part of your mother, it's alive. Part of your mother, it's alive. When they learned that their mother's sales had saved lives, the family felt proud. But they, but they also felt confused. Hold on, we just lost our connection to the radio station just a second here. Are we back on the air? All right. Okay. All right, guys. We lost our connection with Skype. Okay, we, we lost our connection with Skype. We're, we're back on the air. All right. So, uh, right before the break, I was giving you some background information on Henrietta Lacks. We're gonna go back to the interview that took place today that announced the lawsuit. But um, Henrietta Lacks' uh, daughter-in-law found out by accident that her mother-in-law cells were being used. Um, when she met someone, her daughter-in-law met someone from the National Cancer Institute who recognized her surname, Lax, L-A-C-K-S. And he said that he was um, using sales that came from a woman named Henrietta Lax. He was using sales that came from a woman uh, named Henrietta Lax. So the daughter-in-law rushes home and told Henrietta Lacks' son, Lawrence, she said, quote, part of your mother, it's alive, end quote. Part of your mother, it's alive. Now, when they learned their mother's sales had saved lives, the family of Henrietta Lacks felt proud, but they also felt confused, a bit frightened, used, and abused. It had never occurred to anyone to ask permission to take their mother's tissue tell them that her sales had changed scientific history or even to say thank you and certainly no one had ever suggested that they deserved a share of the profits no one had ever suggested that they deserved a share of the profits okay now the um in in in, in researching this some more today i found out that um uh, her sales were used not just in in vitro fertilization and cloning and Parkinson's and leukemia and, and the flu vaccines. I already knew that, but also in making lipstick and makeup, but also in the COVID-19 vaccine as well. And if we go and I looked at a number of different sources and they talked about this in this in this interview, uh, if we look at the piece here from National Public Radio, NPR.org, um, it says that uh, reproduce infinitely ever ever since HeLa cells have become a cornerstone of modern medicine enabling countless scientific and medical innovations including including the development of the polio vaccine genetic mapping and even COVID-19 vaccines all right I want to go back to this uh interview uh uh, attorney Benjamin Crump and some members of Henry Alex's family um, spoke to uh, CBS News today. Let's go back to this clip, uh, Shakita. Our profit 
putting off the research of using it in black people and their illnesses and their bodies. And there has never been a clear case of this exploitation than when they unethically took Henrietta Lacks cells without her consent nor her permission, and they continue to manipulate her genetic material till this very day, uh, having made drugs that they have been unjustly enriched while her family, her son, and all of her grandchildren have never been afforded any equity. And so they are here to make sure that the pharmaceutical corporations know that they are the legacy of Henrietta Lacks and they are the ones who will speak for Henrietta Lacks. And what specific legal steps are you taking on behalf of the family? Uh, are you suing these pharmaceutical companies? Um, and what are you asking for? And do you believe that this case could set a new precedent? Certainly, uh, Attorney Chris Steger and I are bringing a lawsuit based on unjust enrichment. Uh, and we have evidence that these companies have profited off of the research of her sales. We're doing everything from the COVID-19 uh, vaccine all the way to making lipstick and makeup. I mean, they have used her sales for every modern drug that we know. And they have made billions, but yet her family hasn't been afforded any equity. So this will be an unprecedented lawsuit, and we pray that it will set a precedent much in the way that we are finally having the conversation about reparations in America and the value of black life. And so to anyone in the Lax family that wants to answer this question, um, what would justice look like for your family and for your grandmother's legacy? Justice would look like Trayvon Martin. Justice would look like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the host of others that were unjustly uh, victimized. So justice to us with our grandmother would be greatly appreciated. You know, and not only that, it would be a benefit to the other, other black communities and the community as well as at large because we intend to live her legacy through us, through foundations and charity and what have you. So justice would look, look pretty much like that. It's finally uh, coming to the age of, of fairness and uh, just it's emotional, really, but it's black equality. Black equality, and that's what you said it right now. Mm -hmm. It's clear. Obviously, people are saying this is 70 years that they have been using her sales. The statute of limitations has passed. You can't bring a lawsuit. Well, our position is they are still manipulating her genetic material to this day. And when they did it, when they got the COVID-19 vaccination, well, that is a new cause of action. That, that statute of limitation has not ran yet. When they did it to help with the PBN uh, vaccine that they're saying all the children have to have, well, that is a new cause of action that the statute of limitation has not ran. So it will be an unprecedented lawsuit, and we pray that it is landmark that it can impact the value of black life in American society. All right. Well, Attorney Ben Crump and members of Henrietta Lacks's family, thanks to all of you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's from uh, CBS News Today announcing this landmark lawsuit that the family of Henrietta Lacks has filed. Attorney Benjamin Crump, you heard there in the interview, he's one of the attorneys uh, of the family. 
so I mean, this is this is huge. If we go, I, I read a number of different articles today about them. Half the articles written by the Associated Press and different outlets pick them up. Um, ABC News, NBC, uh, those about Associated Press, BlackAmericaWeb.com. That's about Associated Press. Uh, some of them had a few variations. I read probably about four or five articles uh, about this today about the lawsuit. But if we look at this one here from uh, let's go to this one here from ABC News. Henrietta Lacks Estate sues company over use of her sales. Also, if you have a quick question or comment, give us a call 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Um, the estate of Henrietta Lacks sued a pharmaceutical company on Monday saying it has been selling her cervical sales without her knowledge or, or consent. So Thermal Fisher Scientific Inc. This is the company that they filed the lawsuit against uh, today. Thermal, Scienti Th Thermal uh, Fisher Scientific Inc. Now, uh, Thermal Fisher Scientific Inc. of Waltham, Massachusetts, they allege knowingly mass produced and sold tissue that was taken from Henrietta Lacks by doctors at the hospital at John Hopkins Hospital, Johns Hopkins Hopkins Hospital, and quote, a racially unjust medical system, end quote, her estate's federal lawsuit alleges. The lawsuit asked the court in Baltimore to order Thermo Fisher Scientific to quote, disgorge the full amount of its net profits obtained by commercializing the HeLa sale line to the estate of Henrietta Lacks, end quote. It also seeks an order permanently enjoining Thermo Fisher Scientific from using the HeLa sale line without the estate's permission. They want them to stop using the HeLa sale line without the estate's, with the estate of Henrietta Lacks permission. On their website, on their website, Thermo Fisher Scientific, on their website, they say that their company generates approximately $35 billion in annual revenue. On Thermo Fisher Scientific's website, they say that their company generates approximately $35 billion in revenue annually. Now, a company spokesman reached by ABC News did not immediately comment on the lawsuit. The remarkable science and the impact of the Lax family have been documented in the best selling book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lax, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lax by Rebecca Sklut, and then also. Um, Oprah Winfrey portrayed Henrietta Lacks' daughter in the HBO movie about Henrietta Lacks. In the movie, Think Like a Man, which I have seen over 50 times, Think Like a Man, because that's Megan Good in it, okay? And it has Gabriel Union, okay? <laughs> okay, and it, uh, uh, it has, so it has a lot of people, a lot of people in it. Um, there's a scene in the beginning of the movie where Megan Good's character is in the line at a bookstore and uh, she runs into uh, Terrence J, who used to be on BET, Terrence J's character. And she's, uh, I think she's on the phone and she talks about somebody read the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. They mention it in the movie, Think Like a Man. They mention that book by Re Rebecca Sklut. It's just a second, okay? If you don't know what she's talking about, it just goes over your head. But it's in it's in the movie. So um, a, a, as we said at the beginning, a group of white doctors at John Hopkins in, 19, in the 1950s preyed on African-American women with cervical cancer, cutting away tissue samples from their patient's service, uh, uh, services uh, without their patient's knowledge or consent, the lawsuit says. The exploitation, quote, the exploitation of Henrietta Lacks represents the unfortunately common struggle 
experienced by black people throughout history. OK, the lawsuit goes on to say, quote, indeed, black suffering has fueled innumerable medical progress and profit without just without just compensation or recognition. Various studies, both documented and undocumented, have thrived off the dehumanization of black people, end quote, the um, lawsuit uh, goes on to say. All right. So. Uh, read this one here from ABC News. Henrietta Lacks Estate sues company over the use of sales. Yes, News interviewed uh, Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks family, her grandson and some other family members, as well as attorney Benjamin Crump. That video is in this article here from CBS News. Henrietta Lacks family sues biotech company over sales, says it, quote, chose to use her body for profit, end quote chose to use her body for profit. So uh, also happy uh, 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 birthday to Henrietta Lacks. Her birthday, uh, her 101st birthday would be this Sunday, uh, October 10th. And we know she passed away 70 years ago on this date, October 4th, 1951. All right, let's go quickly to this next story here. Um, this is, this is a follow-up to our story yesterday. We're going to go to clip two Shakita from the black news channel yesterday on our Sunday show. And we're on for two hours on Sundays, 9 PM to 11 PM. We have a rebroadcasting. It's on our, uh, Facebook fan page, the African history network and our YouTube channel, Michael M hotel, I M H O T E P. And it's an audio podcast format. Download the iHeart radio app, download the iHeart radio app. Search for uh, the African History Network show. The full audio podcast, the Sunday show is there. But on Sunday, our lead story was this this story here from the uh, New York Times. And, and Washington Post has picked up the story as well. More than half of police killings are mislabeled study fines. Stud new study says more than half of police killings are mislabeled, new study says. And this was a study that came out uh, Thursday, September 30th. Uh, from the British medical journal, The Lancet, okay? And the study talks about how, uh, about from 1980 to 2018, about 55% of fatal encounters with police have been undercounted. Uh, 31,000 uh, police killings were reported over that uh, approximately 40 year period of time, but it's undercounted by about 17,000, okay? Um, Researchers estimated that over the time uh, over the time period of 1980 to 2018, um, which roughly tracks the era of the war on drugs and the rise of mass incarceration, nearly 31,000 Americans were killed by police, with more than 17,000 of them, with more than 17,000 of them uh, going unaccounted for in the official statistics. Uh, the study also documented the stark racial gap. African Americans were 3.5 times uh, were 3.5 times as likely to be killed by police as white Americans. Data on Asian Americans was not included in the study, but Latinos and Native Americans also suffer higher rates of fatal police violence than white people. So on um, your know, Dita Wode show on the Black News Channel. On October 1st, um, that was Friday, October 1st, she spoke with uh, former federal prosecutor Paul Henderson. They talked about this study, but they also talked about how um, local, uh, they talked about how states and local, uh, local cities are taking matters into their own, own hands when it comes to police accountability. And they talked about the state of California and the state of Maryland, new policies, new laws they're putting in place to deal with police accountability. Let's go to this clip, Shakita. While negotiations on police reform seem to have stalled in Washington, D.C., several states are taking matters into their own hands and launching police accountability measures of their own. At the same time, there's alarming news about the persistence of police violence and in-custody deaths. 
new research from the University of Washington published in the English medical journal The Lancet says that more than half of police killings are mislabeled. And in Florida, a woman is bringing a wrongful death lawsuit after her baby died after she gave birth alone in a county jail cell. Back with me to discuss all of this is veteran prosecutor and BNC's legal contributor, Paul Henderson. All right, Paul, Governor Newsom, your governor in California, has signed a new policing reform legislation that really only gets California up to speed with most other states. It sets up a um, decertification system for police who act criminally or with bias and bans certain restraint holds. It also bans membership in police gangs, something that's been a problem within the uh, L.A. Sheriff's Department. Is this effective legislation or does California need to come harder? Well, I, I would say both. It is effective legislation, and we still need to continue coming harder. Part of the reason for that at a state level is, you know, there's still a lot of gaps in both defining what reforms for law enforcement should be and what accountability for law enforcement should be. But the fact that we're having this conversation coming off of the failed and stalled attempt now with George, the George Floyd bill, I think is really relevant, but it shines a light on what's possible in terms of how we move this conversation forward. We can't just wait at the federal government, and we can have meaningful legislation like we see here in California at the state level, but we don't have to wait for that as well because we can have these same conversations at a local level as well. It's interesting to me when we were talking about it, you were introducing the story, talking about the revelation from the article today talking about that over half of the information that's being disseminated, both about reform and about accountability, is mislabeled and isn't collected. And that, to me, shines a light on exactly what this issue is in terms of not just the killing, but for reform and accountability, which is all around data. We can't fix what we don't talk about, and we can't talk about what we don't know. So the first start of that analysis comes with the collection of data, and that's the first step. We have to collect data, and we have to do it in a way that is reflective of best practices, meaning we can't rely on the agency to collect their own data about themselves. That's how we got to the why disparity in that article in the first place, talking about the why disparity and the inaccuracy of the agencies monitoring themselves. That data collection step needs to take place or be mandated by outside agencies and or legislators at a local, state, and federal level to make sure that the information is available that they collect. And I would say, to reflect best practices, that needs to focus on race specifically, collect data about race, because the race disparities that are embedded into law enforcement and policing can't be revealed until at least we can accurately measure it and then move on to the next steps. And those next steps, obviously, are after you've collected data to make it transparent, publish it. And then the third step for data is to analyze that data and talk about both the trends and the results. And then we can talk about what the solutions are and how they need to take place in all of those jurisdictions. And I'll just tell you what the answer is, is effective policy, training, and then the last step is accountability to make sure that all of that stuff is taking place in the way that we've asked for it and demanded for it to take place. There was a lot to unpack with you. Sorry about that. But there's so much there with that first string of data. Being all right. Um, we're out of time here on 19 a.m. Superstation WFDF. Those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. We'll keep broadcasting for a few more minutes. If you're watching on my social media platforms, keep watching. We're going to keep going. Be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and register for the uh, new 10-week online course that I teach on Sundays, uh, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. I'm sorry, this one's Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school, 12 noon to 2 p.m. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. Uh, we had a great class, number one, this past Sunday. I ended up doing two hours. It's supposed to be, I ended up doing three hours. It's supposed to be two hours. As soon as you register, you can watch it. The class is on sale, $80 regularly, $130 at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. 
we have to get out of here right now. Let's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Stand by. Stand by. Let me cue this up here. Uh, we're going to keep going. Those watching on uh, Facebook and YouTube, keep watching. Let's see. Uh, let me pull this up. We're only on for an hour, Monday through Friday, uh, on the radio station. So let me go to this clip here. And then after this, we'll talk for a few minutes about the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, September uh, 18th was the anniversary of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 passing. Okay, let's cue this up here. Also, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Let's go back to this clip here. Solution is some cities have better practices than others, and that's not really fair. That you can't determine whether or not there's going to be either reform and or accountability as you're driving along, transitioning from county to county, city to city. Having these solutions embedded at a state level makes the difference, and having leadership at the national level makes a difference and i believe that the solution and this is why i'm encouraged by all of these stories is that we're seeing piecemeal solutions coming up at all three of those levels my point is that all of them need to keep coming together so that we can continue to see solutions working collaboratively so that we get a national model that's enforced at a state level and executed at a local level so that anywhere and everywhere you go you start to see these solutions. And the other thing that I just want to mention, because you talked about it when we first started talking about these stories, is that we don't want to just focus on one singular agency. We can't just talk about the police and not consider that we still have to fix sheriffs and deputies and folks that are in custody. That's law enforcement as well. There's so many spectrums of law enforcement. They all can do for reform and they all need to be accountable to the communities in which they're supposed to serve, specifically disenfranchised communities because of the race disparities that have been proven through statistics in spite of the bad data that we were talking about. It's already been proven and we already know that that exists. All right, turning now to a very, very disturbing story um, from today's New York Times. Paul, more than half of police killings are mislabeled by medical examiners. Uh, and that's according to a University of Washington study published in The Lancet. Uh, the study suggests a level of collusion collusion between police and medical examiners. Surprising? Uh, it's not surprising at all. And again, it goes back to what we were just talking about with the data. As long as the agencies responsible or involved in the killing are doing their own reporting, I think this is to be expected. I mean, it's not a surprise to me that those agencies have misreported more than half of their data. Again, it calls for us to start by forcing that data to be collected in a way that we demand as voters, as we demand of community citizens, and as we demand of our leaders to make that data collectible and transparent and define what that data is. And it can be done through third parties. Obviously, best practices are if you have civilian oversight of those law enforcement agencies, but all of that can be baked into even statewide or local legislation so that those agencies have to do mandatory reporting and the standards are independently determined as to what qualifies for that reporting. That, that's why we have the disparities. But again, now that we know what the answers can be, we know how to advocate and work towards those answers to make sure that we're not having the same conversation five years from now, 10 years from now. All right, Paul Henderson, veteran prosecutor and BNC's legal contributor. As always, thank you so very much for spending your Friday night with me. Okay, so that was uh, making the case with Yadit Kawode from uh, Friday, October 1st. Uh, great segment there. And they talked about um, Maryland and California making police reforms outside of the the 
George Floyd Justice and Policing Act and the federal government, the majority of control when it comes to uh, policing, the, the majority of control over policing is not at the federal level, it's at the state and local level. And that deals with the 10th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, states' rights. So they were talking about changes made in California, Maryland, in addition to this big story that we talked about yesterday on our Sunday show um, from the New York Times. Uh, more than half of police killings are mislabeled, new study says. I also talked about this a little bit Friday, October 1st, when I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered, and we spoke with Felonis Floyd, George Floyd's brother. Okay, so uh, check out this uh, segment here from uh, the Black News Channel from October 1st, 2021. Several states taking police accountability measures into their own hands. Several states taking police accountability measures into their own hands. Okay, and um, we'll post a link here for we'll post a link here to that video as well, so you can watch that. Okay, uh, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And then also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. This is our official Cash App account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. When you go to it, it says Michael and shows my picture there. These others are fake African History Network Cash App accounts. Okay, so this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. We're here six days a week. Um also you can we're going to go to the fugitive slave hack here in just a second i teach two online uh courses they're both 10-week online courses uh we just talked about ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school i teach that one on sundays 12 noon to 2 p.m okay so that just started up uh we had a great class number one the second class that I teach is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Okay. And uh, that's on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. This one, the second class picks up where understanding the transatlantic slave trade leaves off. And we go through and we look at uh, some history leading up to the Civil War, some events leading up to the Civil War. We start with the Louisiana Purchase, 1803. And uh, then we deal with the Civil War, 1861, 1865, Jim Crow era. Uh, uh, we look at World War I, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement, and look at what happened to us uh, after slavery ended, okay? What happened to us after slavery ended? What were the laws and policies put in place to put us in the predicament we're in now so we, we understand where we need to go from here, okay? And we also see how history is repeating itself as well because um after re after reconstruction ends in 1877 we see that the southern states are uh passing laws to suppress the african-american vote just like um republicans in state legislatures across the country are trying to pass laws to suppress the african-american vote and latinos and uh, uh asian americans etc we see this taking place uh, in the 1890s, uh, late 1880s, 1890s, even go back to 1876 with Texas and the Texas state constitution. And we see that they're um, uh, passing poll taxes and literacy tests and writing these into their state constitutions. And in some cases, writing into the state constitution, uh, property ownership requirements to be able to vote as well. Okay. So, um, we saw this after reconstruction ended to suppress the african-american vote and we see some some similar methods taking place today all right so you can register for that one also that's on sale for a limited time only 70 dollars regularly uh 130 dollars from the civil war to the civil rights movement of black power 1865 to 1968 okay and i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips etc we go through a timeline of history each class we go through and analyze approximately a 10-year period of history. Okay, and that's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll post a link here also so you can register. 
All right. So September 18th, I did not get a chance to talk about this here. Um, we're trying to squeeze this in the past few days. September 18th, 1850, the uh, Fugitive Slave Act was uh, was passed. OK, and this was part of the uh, Compromise 1850 that consisted of five bills and dealt with a lot of that. Uh, a lot of it had to do with um, organizing the territory that uh, was a result of the Mexican-American War and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848. OK, so if we look at this piece here from the Zen Education Project. On September 18th, 1850, the U.S. Congress, the U.S. Congress passed uh, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which required people who had escaped from slavery be captured and returned. It required uh, runaway slaves to be captured and returned. Now, textbooks often repeat the propaganda of Confederate apologists that the Civil War was fought to preserve states' rights, that the Civil War was fought to preserve states' rights. That's false. OK, that's, that's, that's not true. No, they, the, the South thought the, the Union was going to the South thought Lincoln was going to abolish slavery. The first state to secede from the Union was South Carolina, December 20th, 1860, about six weeks after Abraham Lincoln becomes president elect uh, of, the, of the Republican as to becomes president elect. And he was the uh, presidential uh, nominee of the Republican Party. Now, where was where was this love for states rights when the South demanded strict enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act so that northern states could not become a haven? for people escaping slavery. So they sent because see, a lot of the Northern states had abolished slavery by this time, okay? So they're saying, okay, well, wait a second, what about the state's rights of Northern states? If they're free states, the Fugitive Slave Act, 1850, which was federal law, this is enforcing slavery that exists in Southern states, but it's saying that if, if a, a slave runs away from Georgia and runs up into New York, then the sheriff up in the, the New York area can uh, deputize a white man to go hunt down this runaway slave, take him back and turn him over to his master in or her master in Georgia. Well, what about the state's rights of New York, which is free territory? So the Compromise of 1850 enacted the Draconian Fugitive Slave Act, which demanded that all American citizens act as slave patrollers, end quote. It demanded that all American citizens act as slave patrollers, explains Manisha Sinha in Civil War Revisionism Still Shames America. Civil War Revisionism Still Shames America. Be it further enacted, that any person who shall knowingly and willingly obstruct, hinder, or prevent such claimant, his agent or attorney, or any person or persons lawfully assisting him, her or them from arresting such a fugitive from service or labor, or shall harbor or conceal such fugitive shall be subject to a fine not exceeding $1,000 and imprisonment not exceeding six months. So if you are harboring a runaway slave, let's so see what happened was because of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, this intensified the abolitionist movement and it caused more runaway slaves to go into Canada because you weren't safe up north, okay? It caused more runaway slaves to go into Canada and it made it more dangerous for abolitionists in the North. This is saying that if you help, uh, 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 if you're in the North and you help harbor a runaway slave, help them escape, et cetera, uh, you could be subject to a fine not exceeding $1,000 and imprisonment not exceeding six months. Now, this was federal law. This was part of the compromise. This was part of the 
Compromise of 1850, which we'll talk about in just a second. So we deal with this in the, um, the my online course from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968, because the Fugitive Slave Act was part of the Compromise of 1850, which consisted of five bills. The Compromise of 1850 was the was 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 needed. It was a result of the Mexican American War of 1846 and 1848 and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, which officially ends the Mexican American War. So all of this is connected. All this is connected. Now, people who were captured were not allowed to testify in their own defense. Uh, the the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 removed habeas corpus. So uh, it removed people to uh, the runaway slaves to have a right to a trial. OK, they can just be taken and turned back over to their slaves, to their slave masters without a trial. This went further than the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, which was signed into law by President George Washington. In no trial or hearing under this act shall the testimony of such alleged fugitive be admitted in evidence. In no trial or hearing under this act shall the testimony of such alleged fugitive be admitted in evidence. The lessons and other resources below can be used to teach about the Future Slave Act. So check this out here from Zen Education Project, uh, Zen, uh, zenedproject.org, September 18th, 1850, Future Slave Act, okay? All right, now, and if you like any of this type of information, we'll, we'll post a link here for, um, the uh, online course that I, he's dealing with uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, because we get deep into all of this um, history and leading up to, uh, th these are important events that lead to the Civil War taking place. All right, now, if we look at uh, very quickly here, um let's let's look at this piece here uh on the compromise of 1850. let's look at this very quickly this is from history.com history.com is the uh official website of the history channel now, it's also important to understand that by 1787, before the U.S. Constitution is uh, signed, by 1787, five states have abolished slavery, uh, starting with Vermont. Uh, Vermont, the first state to abolish slavery in 1777. Uh, you have Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Massachusetts abolishes slavery about 1780. So they either abolish it fully or abolish the international transatlantic slave trade. But you have this taking place before the Constitution is signed in 1787. Uh, if we look at this here on the Compromise of 1850, which the Fugitive Slave Act was part of. Okay, so the Compromise of 1850 was made up of five bills that attempted to resolve disputes over slavery in new territories added to the United States in the wake of the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848. It, uh, the the, the, the uh, Compromise of 1850 uh, admitted, well, the U.S. admitted California as a free state. Uh, this, this, so this is part of the Compromise of 1850. It admitted California as a free state it left Utah and New Mexico to decide from the, for themselves whether to be a slave state or a free state. Uh, and it defined a new Texas, New Mexico boundary, and it made it easier. It made it easier for slave owners to recover runaways under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So these were the five bills that were that were in the Compromise of 1850. Uh, California is admitted to the union as a free state. Uh, and we know California was 
uh, Mexican territory. So because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, the U.S. gets the territory that makes up California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Nevada. OK, those six states are going to be carved out of the territory that the U.S. gets from Mexico for about uh, is about 15 million dollars. I think it's about 15 million dollars or so. Um, and Mexico uses loses a third of their territory. This is all part of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. So California comes to the Union as a free state. Utah and New Mexico uh, can decide for themselves whether or not to have slavery or be a free state as opposed to it being dictated to them by the federal government. And uh, a new Texas-New Mexico boundary is defined. And then the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Now, the Compromise of 1850 was the mastermind of Whig Party Senator Henry Clay. Henry Clay. And the Whig Party was a political party uh, founded around 1834. They're founded before the Republican Party. It's going to be members uh, in the early 1850s, Whig Party is dying out. It's going to be members of the Whig Party and a abolitionists who are, going to, who are going to form the Republican Party in 1854 as a direct backlash to the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. The Kansas-Nebraska Act left it up to people moving out to the Kansas-Nebraska territory to, to leave, it left it up to them to determine whether or not there would be slavery in those new territories as opposed to it being dictated to them by the federal government. Now, lingering, lingering resentment over the provisions of the uh, Compromise of 1850 contributed to the outbreak of the U.S. Civil War, which starts April 12, 1861. If we look here briefly at the Mexican-American War, the Mexican-American War that's going to lead to the Civil War taking place. The Mexican-American War was a result of U.S. President James K. Polk's belief that it was America's manifest destiny to spread across the continent to the Pacific Ocean because these Europeans here in the U.S. want to really take over the entire North American continent. OK, following the U.S. victory, Mexico lost about one third of its territory. Um, including nearly all of present day California, including all of uh, nearly all of present day California, Utah, Nevada, Arizona and New Mexico. A national dispute arose as to whether or not slavery would be permitted in the new Western territories. So Senator Henry Clay, when we look at who was responsible for the Compromise of 1850, Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky, a leading statesman and member of the Whig Party, W.H.I.G., known as and uh, he was known as the Great Compromiser for his work on the Missouri Compromise of 1820 was the primary creator of the Missouri Compromise, fearful of the growing divide between North and South over the issue of slavery, he hoped to avoid civil war by enacting a compromise. Famed orator and Massachusetts Senator Daniel Webster, while opposed to the extension of slavery, also saw the, comp saw the Compromise of 1850 as a way of averting national discord and disappointed his abolitionist supporters by siding with Henry Clay. When Henry Clay, facing health problems, grew too ill to argue his case before the Senate, the U.S. Senate, his, his cause was taken up by Democratic Senator Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois, an ardent proponent of states' rights, when it came to deciding the issue of slavery. Okay? All right, now... Um, the main point, you can read the rest of that there, okay? So we run out of time here. The main points of the Compromise of 1850. It permitted slavery in Washington, D.C., but outlawed the slave trade. It added California to the Union as a free state. It established Utah and Nevada as territories that could decide via what's known as popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty if they would permit slavery. Popular sovereignty meant that People living in those territories could decide whether or not they have slavery as opposed to it being dictated to them by the federal government uh, that they're going to have slavery. This, this is known as popular sovereignty. 
uh, it defined new boundaries for the state of Texas following the Mexican-American War, removing its claims to parts of New Mexico by awarding the state $10 million in compensation. And then the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 required citizens to assist in apprehending runaway slaves and deny the slave people a right to trial by jury. Denied them a right to trial by jury. Now, the uh, Fugitive Slave Act of uh, was passed by Congress, the first one, in 1793. That was signed into law by uh, President George Washington, okay, who was a big time slave owner also. He owned uh, 318 slaves. He and, he, he and his wife Martha, they collectively owned 318 slaves. When he married Martha, she owned more than he did, but they collectively owned 318 slaves. He, he was a big time slave owner. So the first Fugitive Slave Act was passed by Congress in 1793 and authorized local governments to seize and return people who had escaped slavery to their owners while imposing penalties on anyone who had attempted to help uh, them gain their freedom. The, the Fugitive Slaves Act of 1793 encountered fierce resistance from abolitionists, many of whom felt it was tantamount to kidnapping. Now, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 compelled all citizens to assist in the capture of runaway slaves and denied enslaved people the right to a jury trial. It also placed control of individual cases in the hands of federal commissioners who were paid more for returning a suspected slave than for freeing them. They were paid more for returning a suspected slave and for freeing them, leading many to argue the law was biased in favor of Southern slaveholders. Outrage over the new law only increased traffic along the Underground Railroad during the 1850s. And the Underground Railroad starts in the early 1830s, right around 1831. Northern states avoided enforcing the law and by 1860 the number of runaways successfully returned to slaveholders hovered around just 330 okay northern slate northern states avoided enforcing the law even though it was dangerous for runaway slaves to go to stay up north that's why more of them started going into canada because of the fugitive slave act of 1850 and the movie harriet um uh, talks about the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 as well. Northern states avoided enforcing the law, and by 1860, the number of runaways runaways successfully returned to uh, slaveholders hovered just around 330. Both acts were repealed by Congress on June 28, 1864, following the outbreak of the Civil War. Uh, the event. Uh, the event proponents of the Compromise of 1850 had hoped to avoid. They hoped to avoid the Civil War. But both uh, Fugitive Slave Acts were repealed by Congress June 28, 1864. Um, and we know the Civil War is basically going to end April 9th, 1865, a few days before Lincoln is assassinated. When uh, General Robert E. Lee surrenders to General Ulysses S. Grant uh, at the Appomattox Courthouse, uh, this basically ends the U.S. Civil War. Okay, so check out this piece here from History.com, the official website of the History Channel, Compromise of 1850. And this gives background information on the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 and the Compromise of 1850, which consisted, uh, which consisted of five bills. One of those bills was the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Okay, so we'll post this link here on the thread of the broadcast also. Uh, you can read more about that. And if you like uh, this type of information, then the online course, the 10 week online course that I teach, dealing with history from 1865 to 1968, is going to blow you away. Uh, so you can register for that at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And we posted the link here as well from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. All right.
Look, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Oh, I, I, I should be on Roller Martin Unfiltered on Tuesday. So look out for me there. We'll talk about it tomorrow. This producer contacted me. They wanted me on the show today. I couldn't do it today. I, I turned down two media interviews today because I'm so busy. Um, and I was I was worn out, too. I didn't get up to about noon because um, I got to bed at 4 a.m. I was editing video of Sunday's show. So I'll be on Roller Martin un, uh, Unfiltered on Tuesday. Uh, October 5th, and then I'll be back on the show on Friday as well.